Um, as, as you heard, my name is Joe Kissel, and I, I wrote, I, I'm, I'm an author, I've, I've written a lot of books, and a couple of years ago, I, a weird thing happened, I actually bought the publishing company that was publishing my books, so now I've also added a publisher's cap. So, um, I want to tell you uh, about, uh, there we go, um, about misconceptions tech misconceptions. And, uh, you know, I have, I have a couple of kids. Well, I have, I have like a, an adult kid, but I also have a couple of young kids at home. And uh, I'm going to use them as examples to help me share with you some things that, that I've learned and that, that may help you to overcome tech misconceptions. So here's the story. Uh, several years ago, I realized that I was getting a lot of email from my readers, people who read my books and articles, um, that didn't just show that they didn't know how something worked, but that they thought they knew how something worked and they were just a little bit off. And unfortunately, that mismatch between what they expected and what they got caused a lot of grief. So I wrote this series of articles called Flipped Bits uh, that talked about common tech misconceptions. And then later on, I expanded those articles into a full book, which I'll tell you about later on. So anyway, in the process of writing those articles in that book, I realized that the people who were asking these vexing questions reminded me in both good ways and bad ways of my young children. So I use my kids for a lot of examples and I'll be doing that uh, today too. All right, so we're gonna start with <laughs> the, the very basics when it comes to computers and, and that's this, right? So um, we're gonna talk about the notion of a flipped bit both literally and figuratively. So in computing, we all know a bit is just a value that can be a one or a zero. And we know that eight bits make a byte and 1,024 bytes make a kilobyte and so on up through megabytes and gigabytes and terabytes and beyond. Everything a computer does, storing data, running programs is based on storing and changing the values of bits. When a zero changes to a one or a one changes to a zero, that's called flipping a bit. But when techies talk about a flipped bit, they usually mean it uh, kind of as an insult, <laughs> a little bit. Uh, they, they mean an error. Oh, that guy's got a flipped bit, an, an incorrectly flipped bit. There's nothing wrong with a, a one changing to a zero or a zero to a one, but when, when you get something wrong, that's a flipped bit. Now, in computers, sometimes bits get flipped inadvertently. There was a programming error. There was a mechanical feel, failure, uh, uh, media degradation. Sometimes, and this is true, a cosmic ray randomly striking your hard drive can flip a bit, and you know other things too. And unfortunately, a single flipped bit, whether a, a one should be a zero or a zero should be a one, can mean the difference between a program succeeding and failing. So uh, just take a glance at these strings of numbers here. Uh, you, you might think that they look very, very similar. If you look very, very closely, uh, you'll see that, that six digits in, uh, the top line has a one, the bottom line has a zero. Now, uh, this top line, that, that string of ones and zeros, happens to be uh, the binary representation of the word win. So those first eight ones and zeros together make the letter W. And there, if you just change one of those ones to a zero, you get a completely different uh, word with a completely different meaning. You uh, Meaning you just turned a win into a sin. So my point is that little things mean a lot and they mean a lot just not just in in terms of computers but but in your brain too. So a flipped bit is, for our purposes today, a tiny error, seemingly insignificant on its own. Well, there's just one tiny thing that's different. But if the wrong bit is flipped, an entire system can break down. So metaphorically, a flipped bit could manifest itself as a, as a tiny flaw in the way we think about something that has a disproportionate effect in the real world. Now, I wanna be clear about this even though the techies might say, oh, that guy has a flip bit and mean it as an insult, it's not your fault. You, you should not feel blame or shame or remorse over getting something wrong. We all get stuff wrong. You know, I've been in the tech field for, for decades and uh, I, I, I know a lot about computers, but boy, have I made some dumb mistakes. But I, I don't waste time, you know, fretting over that. 
Uh, we all get things wrong, and I will give you some, I think, some great examples of some things that, that uh, are, are commonly misconstrued. You don't have to feel bad about it. You don't have to feel like you are, and uh, you, you, you're you going to have to turn in your geek badge because you've made, uh, because you have a flipped bit. Um, you should regard each of these things as, oh, hey, I learned a new thing. This is an opportunity for me to correct what's in my head. And so uh, once I know more, I can uh, be better at using my devices. So uh, don't, uh, you know, you might hear some stories in just a moment <laughs> that make you feel, oh, I've been doing that and I feel really dumb now. It's okay. Uh, it's, it's okay to make mistakes. We, we all do. All right. I'm going to talk about mental models. Uh, now, this, yeah, it's like a fancy psychological term, but I'm just, I'm just going to keep this really simple. How you think about things, or how the way you think things works, affects how you use and experience them. So we see some machine. We might try to guess what's inside it, how it works. And, and this just happens automatically, even without trying. Our mental image of what's inside the machine or how it works uh, helps us to predict how it will work in the future and what we should do to get a desired result. So a metaphorical flipped bit in our mental model results in a misconception, of which I have encountered countless examples in my decades of writing about technology. So I'm all about correcting the mistakes in those mental models. Once you have a better mental model about what happens behind the scenes in an app or a gadget or a service, you'll be able to make better decisions about how to use it and you'll save yourself time and aggravation. Now, kids start building mental models at a very early age. So one day we were driving with some friends of ours and one of their kids was in the car. He was about two. And as he looked out the car window, he saw this. Now, this two-year-old was terrified, and he started yelling at the plane to turn so it wouldn't hit the moon. Now, his simplistic mental model of the sky was that everything up there was equally far away, which is reasonable enough because we can't, even as adults, accurately judge sizes and distances when things are so far away. We thought it was funny. <laughs> we, had to, we had to calm him down, you know. But what we were really learning was something about the way the brain works. Now, you might think you are immune to this problem as an adult, but my experience writing about technology tells me that most of us still have at least some mistaken mental models. And not just about apps and cloud services and whatnot, also about ordinary household items like this one. Now, this is not a nest. This is a dumb, old-fashioned analog thermostat. This is what you probably grew up with, or at least what I grew up with in my house. So there was this really interesting study done about how people use this type of thermostat. And uh, so this researcher um, hooked up some equipment and uh, over a period of weeks, he would measure the temperature in the house every hour. And he would also uh, check on the, the, the setting on the thermostat, you know, it, was it set higher, set lower, set to what temperature every hour for weeks. And he collected all this data and then he analyzed it for a bunch of different, uh, bunch of different homes. And then um, he, he had some ideas about what this data meant, so he went on to interview uh, some of the occupants of these homes about how they used thermostats and how they imagined that they worked. And so his data showed that uh, people had two two ideas about how thermostats work. Now, uh, I'm gonna refer, he, he referred to these as, uh, as folk theories. I'm gonna refer to them as mental models. We're really talking about the same thing. It's the picture we have in our heads of what's going on behind the scenes, even if we don't actually know what's going on behind the scenes. So uh, the first group of people 
And this is, again, th this is not just his idea, his imagination. This is what the data showed, and this is what was backed up by the interviews, was what he referred to as the valve theory. So what he would, what he would find is that in a lot of houses, the, the temperature in the house would fluctuate a lot during the day. And of course, these fluctuations would correspond with changes in the thermostat setting. You know, people would set it to 80 degrees for a while, then they'd set it down to 60, and then they'd set it to 70, and they'd, they'd keep changing the temperature on it. And, uh, and so what, what this researcher thought was going on and what he confirmed by actually asking people was that this group of people believed that what they were doing when they were changing that number on the thermostat was changing the amount of heat coming out of their furnace. Uh, so they're at, you know, a higher number meant hotter air, okay? Hotter air if you, if you put the number higher, uh, colder air if you put the number lower. And uh, that does make sense, right? Um, that, that is a reasonable thing to do if you see a, a, a dial with numbers on it and you want a hotter you, you want your house to be hotter, of course, you're going to put it to a hotter number. So people were saying they believed that a thermostat worked kind of like the gas pedal on a car. You push down harder, more gas goes through, and so the engine goes faster. Or like a water faucet, you turn it on more and a greater volume of water comes through. And uh, and that was their idea of how a thermostat worked. And so that led them to make certain decisions about how they used their thermostat. So if they came home and their, their house was cold, they would turn the thermostat way up, turn it up to 80, up to 90, under the theory that that would put out hotter air and make their home warm up faster than if they set it to the actual temperature that they wanted it to be, let's call it 70. So then there was a second group of people that had a different notion of how a thermostat worked. And uh, this researcher called this the feedback theory. And according to the feedback theory, uh, the thermostat uh, is sort of like a switch that uh, gets feedback from the environment, namely uh, like, a, like a thermometer, right? And then it, and it, um, it opens or closes, turns on or off this switch that uh, activates or deactivates the furnace accordingly. So in this mental model, uh, or this this theory, there's uh, there's basically a thermometer inside there, and you set the uh, thermostat to the temperature you want. Let's say it's seventy degrees, and when the temperature gets up to seventy degrees, oh, that starts a feedback loop uh, that that uh, flips the switch, turns off the furnace. Now the furnace is off, so the temperature is going to gradually drop, and once it drops uh, a certain distance, maybe five degrees, uh, the switch flips the other direction, turns the furnace back on, and it will continue running until the, uh, the desired temperature is reached. And he noticed that um, the people <coughs> who had this theory of how thermostats work uh, adjusted them uh, very seldom. I mean, they might turn them down at night when they go to bed and they, they really want the temperature to be lower, but they wouldn't keep fiddling with them throughout the day. And they didn't think that the house would heat up faster if they set the, uh, the thermostat to a higher number. Now, here's the thing. As you've been listening to this description, I know that a lot of you were saying, oh, come on, you know, everybody knows how a thermostat works. And clearly, one of those groups is, has got the completely wrong idea. But what you may not realize is that of, of those of you saying that, some of you are in that group that has the wrong idea. So this is the thing. We make mental models of how things work, and we, we adjust our behavior, how we interact with technology based on our ideas. And look, if, if it works, like my house is comfortable. I like the temperature of it. And I get that result by using the quote unquote wrong mental model. It doesn't matter. It's, it's functional. Um, now, it, it turns out that the second model, the feedback theory, is, is very much closer to reality. 
And if you, if you have that mental model, basically your thermostat is, is a switch controlled by a thermometer and it only has two settings, on or off, and it never causes a higher temperature to come out of your, of your vents. If you have that mental model, that will lead you to make different decisions about how you interact with your thermostat, which will save you time and effort and probably uh, save money on your uh, energy bills. So uh, I, I thought this is a great example that almost anybody could, uh, could identify with. It doesn't have to do with computers. It's just, you know, it's just the thermostat. But it, it shows how easy it is to have a, a mental model that isn't exactly, uh, doesn't exactly correspond to reality and therefore might lead you to make a, a slight mistake. Now, there is another category of mistaken mental models that I want to talk about, um, and that's miscategorization. So, um, this is a kind of mistake that I've seen my two young sons make a lot. So like my, my older kid uh, loves to put things in boxes, um, including himself. When he, when he encounters new things, he invariably forces them into existing categories he's already comfortable with. Uh, sorry, just, let me get, okay, great. So let's take this thing, all right? It's a telephone. All right, when my uh, older son was about two, he would pick up a remote control and try to talk on it like a telephone. In his mind, any oblong plastic box with buttons on one side must be a telephone because he's used to a telephone and it's easy to see how he might make a mistake. These, these boxes look very, very similar to each other. But within a couple of months, he eventually understood that a remote control is different. A remote control is the thing we point at the TV to make it play his favorite shows. But then he became confused and frustrated when we got him a toy remote control that only made noise when he pressed the buttons. He would, he would point this at the TV and press the buttons and nothing would happen and he couldn't understand it. So in his, his we, we were watching his mental model uh, about, about these gadgets evolve, you know, in, in almost in real time. First, he was putting all remote controls into the, uh, the, the telephone box, and then he was putting all gadgets that appear to be remote controls into the really controls your TV box. So I would like to give you a few more examples of miscategorization. I mean, I could, I could give you examples all day, but we only have a limited amount of time here. So I want to give you a few other examples that I found from the tech world that you may have encountered and just say a few words about them. Uh, so here's the first one. I get this a lot, actually. Uh, and and the, the miscategorization is that Sync is in the same box as backup, or back, backup is in the same box as sync. So like a, a guy wrote to me last week or so, uh, telling me all about how he was going to use uh, uh, Dropbox for backup. And I'm like, um, brrr, nah, you're really not, you're really not gonna do, <laughs> you're really not gonna do that. Now, look, I use Dropbox. Dropbox is, Dropbox is great. It's, it's a very handy um, service, and, and it's fantastic. Um, and I can see how you might think that it is the same thing as a backup, but, uh, but it's not the same thing. Uh, a backup uh, is, is something that, that gives you uh, another copy of your file all of your files, as many as you want, in another place. And yes, that place could be the cloud. It could be a server. And that server could be in the same room as the servers that Dropbox uses. But with Dropbox and most other similar cloud services, you know, um, OneDrive and uh, iCloud Drive and all these other ones, Google Drive, with, with most of, oh, no, sorry, I, I take that back. Google Drive works, works differently. But, but with most of these, uh, these syncing uh, services, 
what will happen is you, you have a little designated folder on your computer and you put some stuff in there and then it syncs up to the cloud and then if you connect to the same account with another device, then you can see all your same stuff. Great, okay. Now, when you delete a file locally, it gets deleted in the cloud too. That's what sync means. It keeps the same thing everywhere. Now, to be sure, Dropbox and most of these other services will uh, allow you to restore deleted files for a limited period of time. You know, in Dropbox's case, it's, it's 30 days. Um, and so in a sense, that serves as a limited type of backup, but only for the files that you put in that folder and only for 30 days. And uh, if you want to restore things because your cat walked over the keyboard and, you know, accidentally deleted some stuff, you're going to have to restore them one at a time. Now, with backups, the, the whole idea of backups is to protect you from yourself or your cat. So, um, a, a, a backup, let's say it's a, a, it's a cloud backup service like Backblaze. It's not simply going to delete stuff from the backup because it was deleted locally, then it wouldn't be a backup anymore. Uh, so, the idea of a backup is that it holds onto your things for, for much longer, potentially even forever, um, holds on to older versions of things. So you accidentally make a change to a file. Oh, but the previous version is still there in your backup, that kind of thing. So I can easily see why somebody might put those two things in the same box, but they really are quite different. And a backup service uh, as well won't, uh, usually will not give you uh, a view of all of those same files in a folder on all your devices. So it can be, it can be dangerous to put those things in the same box in that you might end up losing data and you don't want to lose data. Here's another uh, miscategorization example. Ads on the web are just like ads on a billboard. Who cares? Yeah, we know companies have to advertise stuff. They will put ads in a newspaper. They'll put ads on billboards. They'll put signs up uh, on the street. Uh, aren't, aren't ads on the web basically just the same thing and okay they might be annoying if there are too many of them but they're fundamentally just a one-way thing uh, that, that causes no harm well no that isn't true at all i mean um I, I think i think most of you probably recognize that uh that online ads are a a very very much different thing in that simply Displaying an ad on your screen isn't isn't a one-way process. It's a two-way process in which the advertiser and or the publisher putting the, the ad on a page uh, can learn a lot about you. They they will learn uh, what kind of computer you have. They might they might be able to track you as you move across the internet. They can tell what you searched for and where you had been previously and what kinds of products you want and even things like how old you are and what your political party is and, you know, what street you live on. There are all kinds of things that, that companies can find out about you simply by the fact that you permit their ads to show up on your screen. I've written a whole book about this and I don't want to get into that specifically now, but my point is that if you think of, of ads on the web as being just as harmless and innocuous as ads on a billboard because those are one-way ads, then you are going to probably take the wrong actions that could leave you open to all kinds of, uh, of things that you don't want, like invasions of privacy. Um, speaking of invasions of privacy, uh, <laughs> a lot of people still seem to think that Google is a search company. Now, I'm not talking about the split between, you know, Google as part of Alphabet. I'm not talking about how, yeah, the same company owns YouTube and, and, and all these other uh, entities. Uh, I'm talking about the fact that Google uh, doesn't get money from your searches. Google gets money from advertising. In fact, nearly all, the vast majority of Google's revenue is from advertising. So what Google is, is an advertising platform. Um, and yes, they have a search engine, and yes, they have Google Docs, and yes, they have uh, YouTube, and they have these other, uh, you know, many, many, many other services. But 
for the most part, the services are not where Google makes its money. This, the, the services are simply a, a, a place to show you ads, a way to get more money, uh, or sorry, a way to get more information about you so that they can target ads more effectively and therefore get more money from advertisers. So if you think of Google as a search company, uh, your interactions with them are going to be very, very different from how you would interact with Google if you think of Google as an advertising company. And this is true whether you are just a person searching the web or you are an advertiser <laughs> uh, or you are a publisher who wants to make money from ads. Uh, how you think about uh, Google is going to determine how you, uh, how, what, what kinds of decisions you make in whether or in what way you interact with their services. Now, so I've talked about uh, the example of the, the plane that the two-year-old didn't want to hit the moon and the thermostat that people have different uh, theories about. And I've talked about the putting things in the wrong box. But there are still uh, many other examples of flip bits, many other examples of flawed mental models. Um, now, I, I talk about a whole bunch of these in, uh, in this book I wrote. I just wanted to give you a few examples because uh, these are some things that you may have encountered or you may know someone that encountered them. Now, uh, I, hope, I hope what I'm about to show you isn't too upsetting, doesn't hit too close to home. Um, th this is a true story. This, uh, th this has been witnessed in real life, and um, I've seen sort of uh, variations on this. Um, and uh, I don't, again, don't want to shame anybody, but um, this is the way some people uh, conceive of web searches. Now, the, the mental model that is mistaken is I can only get anywhere on the web from the Google homepage. So I want you to imagine um, somebody wants to go to the Apple website. All right. Somebody who has this mental model of I can only get anywhere on the web from the Google homepage wants to go and, and see what Apple uh, has to say. So how would they do that? Well, this is, this is the process that some people go through. They open up their browser, okay, browser window, and uh, up in the address bar, they are going to type Google. They're going to type Google, and uh, when they uh, hit uh, enter, of course, what's going to happen is that uh, this page shows up, it's a web search, and hey, guess what? Google was the number one hit for a search for Google. What a surprise. So um, that's, that's how you get to the Google homepage is you click that link. You, you have to click the link to get to the Google homepage, you understand. And, and then, so they go there, and this is what they see. And now that they're on the Google homepage, they can type in the thing that they're actually looking for, which is Apple. Now this does another, another search and uh, it gives you a page of results. And oh look, by, uh, by sheer luck, Apple happens to be the very first hit. Uh, there it is. And if I click on this, then and only then will I go to the Apple website. Now look, <laughs> I, I hope that for most of you, this was as painful to hear as it was for me to say. Um, the, the, every, every part of this series of steps was broken. So typing in Google in your address bar to go to Google is, is of course wasted effort because you're already there. Typing something into your address bar executes a search right there. You don't have to go to a web page first. If, if, you had, if you had just typed in Apple into that address bar, it would have immediately done a search for Apple and you could have avoided two steps. But even that is also wrong because um, if you typed Apple and lifted your finger off the keyboard for one second, um, you would have seen Google try to autocomplete apple.com and then you would have just said, oh yeah, that's the one I want. Um, if you didn't have, if, if, if you know, autocomplete, might not be faster than just typing apple.com, which is the really, really fastest and easiest way to do it, um, but it's pretty fast. So uh, when I see this, and I have seen a number of things along these lines is like I'm in Starbucks with my laptop and I see the person next to me and I just cringe because I'm like, 
okay, you got there. You did. You got where you wanted to go. But man, did you, did you waste so much time and energy and effort to get there? And it's all because no one ever pointed out to you that number one, that thing up in the top of the, of the browser that holds the URL is also a search field. And number two, nobody ever explained to you that you can just go straight to where you want to be. You don't have to go, to, you don't have to use a search to get literally everywhere on the internet. So, um, and again, I, I, I would guess that the people uh, watching this presentation don't have this problem, but you might know somebody who does. It might be a family member, or a parent or something. And uh, if you correct your own mental models and help other people gently, respectfully to correct theirs, it can just make life go a lot more smoothly. Well, what about some other examples? Uh, you know, I've written a lot about uh, passwords. I did a presentation uh, last year for you guys about uh, passwords. And um, one of the misconceptions I've heard is that, hey, as long as I have a great password, like, wow, it's really long and it's random and it's got all these special characters and whatever, it's safe to use it everywhere because it's a great password. And nobody could ever guess this password. No person could guess this password. No computer could guess this password. So if my password is unguessable, then what could possibly be wrong with using that password on every site in the world? Well, you know, what the, the, the thing about that is that on an almost daily basis, we, we read in the news about some big data breach. It could be Facebook, could be uh, Instagram, could be, I mean, there have been so many companies as well as, you know, like credit bureaus and the FBI, like whatever. Big organizations with millions or maybe hundreds of millions of passwords, they get hacked or there's a bug or uh, somebody leaves a, a laptop in a car and it gets stolen. Something happens and uh, one way or another, that list of passwords for, for some particular site gets out. And now uh, hackers have your password for some site. Now maybe that site is Facebook and they don't really care about your Facebook account, but they do care about your email account or your bank account or something else. So they will try that same password that has been leaked everywhere else. And now because you've used the same password everywhere, all of your accounts are at risk and you gotta go change them every place. So that would be a, another uh, example of a flawed mental model that could be very dangerous for you. Uh, I see this one all the time. Uh, you know, we have a lot of customers and I, I see what their email addresses are and a lot of them end with like, you know, comcast.net or rr.com or whatever their local ISP is. And I just, I, I, it hurts me to see that. Like, okay, you're, you sign up for an account with your cable provider or your uh, telephone company or whatever. So now you get internet service at home and they are gonna give you an email address for free. You actually don't have to use that ever. You literally never ever have to use that email address. If you do, uh, then one of the consequences of that will be that if you ever move or you ever switch uh, ISPs, you switch internet providers, then that email address will break and you'll have to email everybody that you ever uh, corresponded with or else um, just accept the fact that a lot of your uh, correspondence is going to vanish into the ether. Um, just because you have an address doesn't mean you have to use it. There are lots of other ways you can get email addresses, in, in, including some that are free and many that let you use your own domain name so that it's completely portable. Uh, here's another one. Speaking of email addresses, uh, you know, again, I, we, we have tens of thousands of customers and uh, as, as on most websites, you know, you, you, you buy a book from us and you enter your uh, email address and that, that turns into your username. So if you want to log in later on, see what you bought, re-download the stuff you bought, of course, you're going to enter your email address. Now then people say, but wait a minute, uh, I changed my email address. Maybe I had <laughs> had a you know Roadrunner address, and I I got smart and I changed it to uh, whatever a Gmail address or something. 
And now, because that old address is no longer valid, it can no longer receive messages, I can't use it to log into your site anymore. Uh, but that's incorrect, because my site doesn't need to talk to your email server in order to log you in. My site just needs to know who you are. And your email address is what you use to tell us who you are, and your password is what you use to tell us that, no, it really, really, really is you. So even if you are using uh, you know, uh, an, an AOL address that hasn't been uh, active for 10 years, uh, for us, it's just a username. It, it's just a string of characters. It means nothing other than who you are. And sure, you can change that on our site if you want to, but changing your email address doesn't prevent you from using that uh, address to log in to all the sites where you used it as a username. And uh, here's another one. I've, I've also written a, a quite a bit about encryption, including full disk encryption. And uh, you know, there, there are a number of different ways that you can encrypt your whole hard drive, and it, or SSD. And it's a good idea to do that. It's a good idea to do that so that if your, uh, your computer is stolen, um, then nobody who doesn't have your login password will be able to read anything on your computer. So that's, that's a smart thing to do. It's good to encrypt all your files. But then I get people saying, well, because I encrypted all my files on my PC, uh, that must mean automatically that everything that I synced to Dropbox is also encrypted or that everything, uh, you know, I email a file to my friend, that's also encrypted, or I copy a file onto uh, another disk, that's also encrypted. Well, no, because that's how file by file encryption works, but that's not how full disk encryption works. And again, that's like another whole, <laughs> another whole topic, which is not what I'm here to talk about, but um, it is an example of a plausible thing that somebody would think if they don't know all the facts of how the what you know what's inside the black box. So, speaking of which, how do you keep your bits from being flipped? Well, I mean, of course, you can go get a uh, PhD in computer science and uh, spend your career learning about all this stuff. Uh, I, I know some people with. PhDs in computer science that still make mistakes. Um, that, that would be great, but it, it's not necessary, and it's also not sufficient. So what can you do? Well, I recommend that you start at first by thinking like a two-year-old. What does a two-year-old do? Well, they use, a, let's say, a simplified, abbreviated version of the scientific method. They, they, they wonder about the world. They want to know why they have endless curiosity. And how do they fulfill that curiosity? They ask questions. What's inside this box that causes it to make that sound? Where do babies come from? Why can't I eat ice cream for every meal? Actually, I don't, I don't have a good answer for that last one. I, I think you should be able to eat ice cream for every meal. But then they experiment. I mean, my kids like to experiment by throwing things. And, um, oh, look, hey, when I drop this thing, it separates into all these pieces. That's cool. It also seems to make daddy say words that I don't hear very often. That's really interesting. Let me see what other things I can do to make daddy say funny words. They experiment. Now, I might think their experiments are irritating, but... Um, at least they are trying to figure stuff out. How do things work? What causes what? And um, it seems to me that adults don't experiment with their computers and other gadgets very much um, because they don't understand them and they're afraid that they'll do the wrong thing and damage the device or its data. And that makes me really sad because for me, experimenting, that is playing with objects is a great way to learn about them. Um, so I'm, I'm encouraging you to have the fearlessness of a two-year-old, also have good backups, when you uh, experiment with your devices. Of course, there comes a time when you also have to put away childish things and think like a grown-up. Because there are things that grown-ups are great at that kids aren't. So uh, I encourage you in particular to pay attention. When somebody tells me uh, an app isn't working right, I ask what happened. And they say, I don't know, it just quit. And there was some sort of error message on the screen. I say, well, what did the message say? And they go, oh, I don't know. I closed it without reading it. I'm like, oh, don't. The, the error message was there to tell you what went wrong and why. You have to read the error message. You have to pay attention. This is how you learn what is going wrong. And at the very least, it gives you something to Google. So pay attention to what you see. Um, don't be oblivious. 
Now, young kids tend not to watch where they're going. Oh, well, look both ways before you cross the street. You know, they're not, uh, all, not necessarily aware of their surroundings and stuff. Now, we as grown-ups should have mastered these skills, but, um, you know, when, when someone wearing headphones is singing along with their tunes at the library or is constantly shattering smartphone screens due to careless handling, I imagine that uh, childish uh, lack of self-awareness is, is, is uh, manifesting itself. Another thing grown-ups do is they look up stuff. You know, I, I regularly get people from, uh, an email from people asking questions about software that are answered in the online help or questions anyone can find in far less time than it takes to send an email message with a quick web search, or questions I answered in the book or article that led the person to me in the first place. So if you're confused or curious about something, your first step should be to consult obvious references um, and not to ask a stranger to find the answer for you. Uh, for some reason, um, grown-ups tend to shun documentation um, uh, and they jump to the conclusion that if an answer isn't immediately obvious, they can't learn it on their own, but, but you can and you should. So you need to think like a grown-up. Now, um, I do think that when you're asking questions, and this is my, my last slide, by the way, you should ask the right questions. Like, why? Why did I have to enter my password just then? What purpose did it serve? Why should I install the security update? Um, the opposite of asking why is not caring. You should also ask, how? How does my phone know where I am right now? How does IMAP let me see the same email messages and all my devices? How does encryption help me? These are both searches for reasons, but from different perspectives. So you can ask how and get a meaningful answer without knowing every last detail. And this will help you to keep your bits from being flipped. So um, I, uh, I, you know, I have a book and um, the book is a little bit outdated, but I think um, most of what it says is still very useful and applicable, and it will help you um, learn more about this process of keeping your bits from being flipped. There's this URL at the bottom of the screen where you can save 30% uh, on your purchase if you're interested in this book. And in fact, um, you can use, once, once you go to that URL, there will be a, a coupon code that's um, applied to your uh, you know, we, we set a cookie, so you can use that to purchase any of our books, and I hope you will check them out. So that's what I have to say, and uh, I would like to know if there are any questions. Okay, if anybody wants to type a question. Okay, I'll, I'll ask a question. Yes, please. What's the most common question you get? common type of question uh, i uh, i don't it even know how to answer he is but you know yeah that that's hard to answer because the kinds of questions i get are so varied um <coughs> but uh very often they they take the form of I'm doing something on the web. Maybe it's, you know, you're trying to order a book from us or you're trying to go to a website and the, the thing that you expected didn't happen. Um, your order didn't go through, or you, you didn't get to the right page, or you got an error message, and people are like, and, and how can I fix this problem? And that kind of goes back to, well, you know, what, was there an error message on the screen? What did it say? Um, tell me exactly what effect you were trying to achieve uh, how, what, what steps you went through to get it. Um, oh, you know, this reminds me, actually, th this is a good thing. So I, I, I'm doing, you know, sort of tech support with my mom on the phone. Um, now my mom's in her 80s and she has a computer and we, we have Skyped together many, many times, but she's been having trouble getting Skype working. And when she's trying to describe to me what she's seeing, it, she, she's talking as though I can see what's on her screen. Well, when I click this thing here, I get this thing pop up. I'm like, okay, I need, I need something more than, than thing. What, what did you click? What popped up? Um, so uh, th this idea that, um, that the, uh, the person on the other end will know what I'm talking about, it, just if I send an email saying my order didn't work or I, or I send an email saying the link didn't work, well, what link to what didn't work in what browser were you uh, on what platform? Uh, tell, tell me more. Uh, I, I think that, that questions involving insufficient context 
are, are very, very common. Okay. Look, like I'm the only one that's got questions. I've got one more. Okay. Okay. What type of books do you that are most popular? And what I'm saying is like step by step books, instrumental, I mean, instructional books, history of something books. I mean, do you understand yeah, what I'm trying to ask? I do. Now, for us, uh, and, and I have to say, this is a little bit of a sore spot with me, actually. Uh, for us, the most popular books are definitely those that provide step-by-step -step instructions. You open this window, you click this button, you type in this, you click this other button, and then you get the result you want. Now, uh, we have a lot of books that do that sort of thing, but I find them very frustrating because um, then, you know, we, we say, okay, here's how you solve this problem. There's five steps. You go through the steps. Great, your problem is solved. Now, uh, a week later, somebody encounters a, a problem that's similar, but a little bit different. The same problem with a different app, whatever. And now they have to go looking for the exact step-by-step -step instructions to follow to, to solve this slightly different problem. It's frustrating for me because I'm very much one of those teach a person to fish kind of guys. Like, I want you to solve your own problems and not, not have to pester me all the time, right? Um, not, I mean, I, I, I love to help, but really, I want you to have problem-solving skills. And unfortunately, um, the, the books where we try to just give you background on how things work so that you can put two and two together yourself are much less popular uh, because they actually require some thought. And um, I, I, I wish that the step-by-step the -step instruction books were less popular and the How Stuff Works books were more popular because um, you would be learning skills that can apply to lots of different areas and <coughs> could save you a lot of time. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's the, a lot of the basics of user groups is walk me through it five times. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, I have I have been a member of uh, several different user groups and I have given talks at I can't even tell you how many user groups. And, and I get that. And I get that, you know, there's a difference between people who are using computers recreationally and people who work with computers for a living. Um, but I, I my, my fondest desire would be for people to not just say, well, I wanted this effect. So I clicked this button, but rather to say, um, I understand what that button does. So I can generalize to, uh, to solve more problems by, by knowing how a little bit about how the stuff works in the background. Yeah. No, I just asked that to see, and it just said it goes with my um, perception that that's the how-to and how to do something was, was the more popular questions. Yeah. Uh, the, the one of them in here, we got to think about another five minutes. Um, they were saying years ago, didn't the URL field require the exact characters to be entered? And if so, when did the URL field also become a search field? Yeah, so uh, that's true. Year, years ago, quite a few years ago, I can't even remember how long ago that changed. But once, once one browser changed that, all the rest said, oh, yeah, I like that idea, too. So uh, for a long time, like Firefox would give you the option to have two fields, like the actual URL field and then a different search field. Um, but I think now they've just kind of given up on, and said, well, everybody expects this one field to do both things. Um, Chrome does that. You know, uh, Edge does that. Uh, Firefox does that. Safari on a Mac does that. They, they pretty much all do that now, nowadays, is that they use the, the one field for either a URL or a search. Now, going back to like my example of somebody wants to go to the Apple site, even back in the old, old, old days where the URL field was not also a search field, had I at that point typed just the word Apple, my browser would have said, oh, when you say Apple, I'll bet you mean, I'll bet you probably mean apple.com, so I'll try taking you there first. Um, so it was very common back in those old days to assume that if you just type a word without a .com or a www or whatever, that that was where you wanted to go. So um, even, even back in those days, I think it would have, the, the, the example would have been approximately the same, but um, I, I, I would have to go back and look at historical versions going back 
certainly more than 10 years to, to figure out when, that, when browsers uh, started uh, integrating the, the search and the uh, URL. Good question. Let me come up with our final question here. Okay. How do you overcome dispelling computer myths without causing fear that they're doing something wrong? Well, you know, um, if, if, you, if you start out being afraid, like, okay, so I, let's just say I've, I've now met you for the first time and I've given my little spiel and, and you have been afraid about doing the wrong thing already for years. I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to overcome that instantly. Um, that, I, like I know from talking to my mom that, that this is not this is not something that you can you can just turn off, um, and it may be that you are fearful for legitimate reasons. Like there was that one time five years ago that you thought you would try something, and whoops, boy, did that have uh, the wrong result. So I'll answer this in a couple of ways. Uh, one way is backups are your best friend. Uh, if you do not already have lots of really great backups for your computer, please, you know, this is a great thing that your user group can help you with. Um, please get your computer backed up really well right now. Backups are great for lots of different reasons, but most importantly is they take the pressure off of you because you know, all right, I'm going to try something. I'm going to try something really really risky, like installing a new operating system. I'm going to try something really, you know, a big deal. Well, if you have excellent backups, then even if the really uh, scary thing fails and, and you lose data and you get the long, wrong result, like, yeah, it's okay. I got another hard drive over here. I'm going to plug it in. I'm going to put my old stuff back. Then I'm good to go. So if you have great backups, the, the worst thing that could happen is that you have to spend some extra time undoing the results of an experiment. So that would be my number one tip. But, uh, you know, my number two tip is um, ex experiment with a friend. So d decide that when you are going to play, when you're going to just poke around with uh, an app or with your computer and see how things work, have a geekier friend just kind of hanging around looking over your shoulder. And... Um, say, now, I don't want you to tell me what to do or what not to do. I only want you to say, hey, stop, if I'm about to, like, do something really, really dangerous, and then explain to me what was dangerous about that so that I know better next time. Like, you know, when, when I first started using Windows, like, I, I don't know how much trouble you can get into using RegEdit. Um, I, I found out. <laughs> but, like, you know... The, you can get into trouble, sure. So, um, uh, you know, have great backups and, uh, and compute with a friend.